Hello everyone, Charles Watts here. Welcome to a Friday edition of Inside Arsenal. We are at the end, or nearly at the end, of the working week. I hope wherever you're watching or listening to this episode around the world, you are having a fine Friday and getting ready to what's going to be a good weekend. A weekend, of course, with no Arsenal. Though, because we are slap bang in the middle of the international breaks, they are getting underway, of course. Now we've had some Arsenal action Overnight, big night for Gabriel over with Brazil. Martin Odegaard playing as well. Uh, the international's beginning to come thick and fast now. So a little bit of discussion about that in today's episode. We'll look at Emil Smith-Rowe, who's been linked to a move to Newcastle. I'll give my thoughts on that. Balogun has been talking about his move from Arsenal to Monaco and his sort of relationship with Mikel Arteta. We'll explore those comments. Uh, got plenty of comments and questions for you guys as well. So let's get stuck in and we're going to start today with the news about Jack Wiltshire. Now if you saw it last night, David Ornstein uh, with the story saying that Colorado Rapids are considering Jack Wiltshire as the new head coach. Uh, They've approached Arsenal, permission granted to talk, the Arsenal under-18s boss impressed in the interview but no decision has been made yet. 31-year-old is keen on a senior role, says David when the right chance arises. And this is a really interesting one, I think. It would be a big, big move for Jack Wiltshire to make. Now, of course, the Colorado, Colorado Rapids are owned. They're all part of the KSC network, the Cronkies. So it kind of be an in-house type move, almost like when Manchester uh, Vieira went over to New York City when he was at Manchester City. So part of the same group. Um, it'd be a much tougher job than Vieira had at New York City. No doubt about that. Colorado Rapids have had a horrendous season, have had a horrendous few years. The fan base is very, very unhappy with the Cronkies. Uh, don't believe the Cronkies are putting any of their time or effort or finance into the club and they're just letting the club sort of just drift completely. I don't think they need to think the stadium needs revamping and needs um, money being put into it. The squad needs being put into it. So they're, de- they're not happy. There's been protests going on um, at the Rapids. And so for Wiltshire to go in there, for his first senior job in a league that, and I'm presuming here, I obviously don't know, but I'm presuming he doesn't know too much about. I doubt that Jack Wiltshire is an absolute expert when it comes to MLS. Um, It would be a really bold, some would say risky move at Arsenal. Now, you know, he's learning his trade very much. He's only been doing it for a season. Um, He's at a club that he knows very, very well that, you know, he knows inside out. People know him inside out. He's got everything he needs in terms of a support network at Arsenal with Mikel Arteta, with Per Mertesacker, with Edu, um, with, you know, the staff that he knows. It, it's the perfect place to almost cut your teeth in coaching. And he's still a very, very young coach. You know, Arsenal took a big gamble, really. And I remember sitting down with Per Mertesacker last summer um, at London Colney for an interview. And he admitted to me that it was a big big gamble to hire Jack but it was a gamble they thought was worth taking and when they sat down with the interview process you know Edu Arteta and Murta Saka all decided that it, they knew that Jack was going to need support if they appointed him because of his inexperience but they felt it was a risk worth taking because they could see something in him he was an Arsenal boy and it just made a lot of sense now he's had a decent first year got the under 18s to the youth cup final of course last season struggled in the league though he's it's been inconsistent results have been inconsistent again I think you have to ex- accept that with a very young coach but it's a good place to learn your trade it's a safe place to learn your trade I think that's the right way to describe it for Jack it's a safe way to learn your trade you go over to the MLS and it is completely different yes you've kind of got that safety net if you want to call it that the fact that it is within the KSC franchise group um, so he'll know the owners, you know, Josh, well, I was going to say Josh and Stan, mainly Josh, you know, will be involved in that. So he will have that support network in a way, but just nothing like at Arsenal will be out on his own in, in America. I imagine his family would go, but it would be a big, big move. But so it's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out personally for me. And this is just my opinion, which counts for nothing on this, but I would say that it would be a better move for Jack to stay at Arsenal for another year. Um, He does want to get into a senior role. I know that he's admitted that to me and other journalists before when we've sat down and interviewed him. You know, this is all part of his ambition to become a senior coach, but you don't have to rush into it and you have to make the right first choice because in this in this kind of world, in modern football, you take the wrong choice and you take the wrong job. It can be very hard to recover from. 
you know, you don't get too many second chances in this game, even at a very young age. You can tarnish your reputation. And so you don't want to do anything wrong. Um, and I just feel like it'd probably be a safer bet to stay at Arsenal potentially for another year, see what other options there are out there in a league that you know better and can make that move. So we'll wait and see what happens with that. Let me know what you guys think on, on Jack Wiltshire. Do you think he should stay? Do you think he should go in the comments below? If you're watching this from America and you're far more um, clued up in the ways of Colorado Rapids than I am, let me know what your thoughts are on that and if you think it would be a good move for him. Um, but yeah, we'll wait and see. There are other options. You know, they I think they are speaking to other coaches as well. It's not just purely Jack Wiltshire. He's just in the running for the job. So we'll wait and see what happens on that one. Okay, big night for Gabriel yesterday. Really big night for Gabriel. In fact, scored his first Brazil goal. Unfortunately, they didn't hold on and get the win against Venezuela. They drew 1-1 to end their winning run um, at home, uh, which is going to be seen as a disappointing result for them. But for Gabriel, it was a really big night. You know, he's... In the last few, in the last few games, really, last couple of international breaks, he really seems to have cemented himself as part of the centre back pairing for Brazil, which is fully, fully deserved because of his performances for Arsenal. Has to be up there with one of the most underrated players there is. You know, William Saliba gets all the flowers, uh, and deservedly so because he's such a good player. But you know, when you talk about Saliba, you have to talk about Gabriel as well because they come as a pair, they come as a partnership, and they're both you know as impressive as each other. And Gabriel's just been so so good for Arsenal, and he's now having that recognised on the international level by forcing his way into the Brazil squad, for me, should have been in it far, far earlier than he was. Um, but he's in it now and you know scored a goal yesterday. His first goal was a really big moment for him. You can see how happy he is. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can see the picture I've brought up on the screen of him celebrating with Neymar. It was Neymar who set him up, swinging in a corner. And it was a classic Gabriel header to make it 1-0, but Venezuela equalised in the 85th minute and a really, really good goal. If you haven't seen it yet, it was a kind of overhead Scissor kick, I'd probably describe it more as a scissor kick than a bicycle kick, but it was a really good goal. Um, he drifted in sort of behind Gabriel and in front of Marquinhos, uh, the Venezuela player, and uh, it's a lovely finish. I'm not sure, I, I was looking at it, it's like, oh, was Gabriel at fault there? I don't think he was, I think it was more Marquinhos' fault. It was Marquinhos was watching the player, he had a good vision, vision of him and probably should have been tighter, but it was a hell of a finish. And um, I was I couldn't sleep last night. I was up, I sort of woke up at two in the morning, couldn't get back to sleep. So I went downstairs. <laughs> and I was looking at my phone when he scored the goal. Um, uh, so if some of you might wondered why I tweeted it out about three and a, three o'clock in the morning UK time. It's because I couldn't sleep. Um, and uh, yeah, it was a shame. Gabriel Jesus came on. He came on for Charleston, sort of midway through his second half didn't score. Um, and Brazil finished one one, which will be a little bit disappointing. But for Gabriel, really huge night. And um, yeah, congratulations to him. Martin Odegaard was in action yesterday as well for Norway, cruising to a 4-0 win against Cyprus. A couple of goals for Erling Haaland in that one. Got plenty more international uh, interest coming up. England playing on Saturday, of course. No Bukaya Saka, but uh, Aaron Ramsdale in that squad. Uh, Eddie Nketiah in that squad as well. And... It, Interesting comments from Ghana coach Chris Hewton, who I'm sure you're all aware of, former Premier League manager, Norwich, Brighton, Newcastle. Uh, it's now the Ghana manager. And he's been talking about Eddie and Ketia because Ghana have been trying to convince Eddie to choose them over England for some time. England, of course, called Eddie up for the last round of international fixtures. He didn't feature. Whether that changes this weekend, we shall see. But even if he plays on Saturday against Australia, it's only a friendly, so he could still still represent Ghana should he decide to. But if he played on Tuesday against Italy in the qualifier, then that's it. That's decision made. He cannot now go to Ghana. But Ghana haven't given up on getting Eddie and Ketia to choose them. These are the, some quotes from Chris Hewton. Um, saying, some players are very definite about what they want. Some are not so sure. And some want to see how things develop. I think that's been the case with Eddie. We would never say never on him switching to Ghana, but it's always down to what the player wants. Um, so it would be interesting. It just depends, really. I think Eddie will probably be sizing this up. I think Gareth Southgate's looking at this um, international break like he did last international break to have a good look at Eddie to probably decide whether he thinks he's going to be um, of the necessary quality to try and force his way into this England squad. If he plays on Tuesday, that's it. Decision made. He is going to be uh, playing for... England, but if he doesn't, then Ghana is still an option for him, and it's you know could be a very good option for him as well. Where he's probably going to look at it and think, where's where's he, where he going to get more caps? He's going to get more caps at Ghana, you would think. But 
ultimately it is down to him and it's down to England as well. So let me know what you guys think on that. Right, turning my attention to Emil Smith Rowe now. Now, um, you all know how much I like Emil Smith Rowe. I think he's a fantastic player, fantastic talent. I want to see him play more for Arsenal. I want to see him get more minutes for Arsenal. Um, but it's just not really happening him at the, for him at the moment. It didn't last season when he came back from injury, and it's not really started off much better for him. He's had a couple of appearances, but still very much on the fringes of things at Arsenal, despite the fact that Gabriel Martinelli's been injured. For a while now, there's more reports about his future. Reports from the northeast saying that Newcastle are looking at Emil Smith Rowe as a potential option for January. Now, this very much, in my opinion, falls in the, to the Jorginho to Barcelona category of no chance. Do not even think about it. Arsenal wouldn't make any sense. Look, I think if this Smith Rowe story continues the way it's going, and he doesn't get many minutes, then look, ultimately he's going to end up leaving. It's just, you know, it doesn't take a scientist to work that out. He wants to play football. He's a very good footballer. It can't continue. As much as he loves Arsenal, and he does love Arsenal, I know he does. I know he's really working so hard to try and force his way into the picture at Arsenal. And he said it before, he'd stay at Arsenal for the rest of his career if he could, if he could play here. But if he's not getting minutes, it's not fair on him. He's too good to be sitting on the bench and not getting any minutes. He needs to go out and play. So I think there's going to come a point, obviously, where this can't continue, where a decision has to be made. But in January, not for me, it would just be, you don't want to weaken your squad at all in January if you're Arsenal. You're going for top honours, you need all your players, even if you're not giving them too many minutes. But in the summer, I think something else happens. But in terms of potentially giving them to Newcastle, that wouldn't make any sense to me. You're strengthening an out-and-out -out rival. And let's face it, Newcastle are an out-and-out -out rival now and they're only going to get stronger. It's inevitable with the money that they have. You know, they're not going to fall away. Newcastle are here and they're here to stay now because of the financial power that they have. So it wouldn't make any sense to me to strengthen um, there. But we'll have to wait and see on it. Um, you know, I think the thing with Emil is, and as much as it pains me to think that he might end up going, if he does end up going, you want to get good money for Emil. And I think it's just really important that Arsenal protect his value this season. He's got to get minutes. He's got to, you know, you can't just be letting Smith Rowe's value plummet to a level where you're basically going to end up losing him for half of what you could have got for him a couple of years ago. It need, he needs to be managed better. I think the situation needs to be managed well. Mikel always talks about rewarding players and giving players the minutes that they need to try and make an impression. And I've said it before, Smith Rowe falls into that category for me. And fingers crossed he can do that. And there is a lot of football to be played a lot of games to come up and hopefully Smith Rowe gets enough opportunities to make his mark at Arsenal and can force his way closer to the first team than he is right now. OK, one player who has gone out, who's kind of in a similar situation to what Smith Rowe was, obviously following Balogun, who moved for that big money move to Monaco. In the summer, £35 million with Arsenal getting a 17.5% sell-on clause included in that deal. He's away with US, obviously, and he's been speaking about kind of Mikel Arteta, what happened in the summer when he came back, what Arteta said to him about his future and how that all planned out. So this is what he had to say following Balogun. He said, he, Mikel, didn't really say much. He just said that when I came back, he said, well done, and he encouraged me to keep going. Then coming back in at pre-season, it was just more about seeing whether I fit into his plans and seeing if I can continue to play some games. He said that he would try to get me involved as best as he could. But of course, he also told me that the people higher up were making decisions on me and seeing what would be best for me. So the conversations between me and him were good, but it was more about the club and what they wanted to do. Um, and yeah, I think obviously there was a lot of attention put onto Balogun in the summer and a lot of attention put into Mikel. You know, is he giving him enough opportunities here? But also I think as Balogun points out in those comments, you had to kind of look at it from a club point of view as well. And this was a club who knew they had a player on their hands who had, was generating lots of interest, whose contract was running down, who had made it clear that he wasn't going to sign a new contract. So from a club point of view, it was just, as I said so many times, it was just, we're going to have to sell. It's going to have to happen. And, you know, for all the talk about Balogun and Mikel, it was ultimately a club decision as well. And for the club, they needed to bring money in summer. at the summer. It was absolutely crucial given the financial outlay they've made and Balogun was a very very sellable asset the most sellable asset that they had and I think it was ultimately the club decided along with Mikel obviously um, 
that that decision had to be made and he had to be sold. And that's how it was. And he's had a very good start at Monaco, uh, scored a few goals as well, which was always going to happen because he's a good striker and he knows that league very well and he's proven he can score goals in that league. And I imagine we'll see him back in the Premier League sooner rather than later. And good luck to him. Right, let's move on to some of your questions and comments now before we finish some of this. Here's one from Wallace69Blue. says, do you think if we go into the uh, transfer market in January, we should be looking at players that will break into the first team or players that just improve the bench? I see Tony is improving the bench, not the starters. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I mean, last summer, last January, sorry, Arsenal went into the market to improve their squad. And I think they did that. They signed Jorginho, who's turned out to be an excellent signing. They signed Trossard, who's turned out to be an excellent signing. They signed Kivio, who... At the times we've seen him, it's turned out to be a decent signing. Looks a good player. Certainly adds to the squad depth. They didn't really sign out-and-out out starters. Um, and they improved the squad. Whether that hap- whether that's different in January, we'll have to wait and see. Personally, for me, you know, I would love them to go out and improve the starting eleven. It's tough to see where they do that. Well, it's not. There's one position at the moment that certainly seems like there is up for grabs, and that's the left eight midfield role, because Kai Havertz hasn't slotted into that position. He hasn't done very well in that position. And if you're looking at strengthening and making the team better out and out, I think you certainly look at that. I don't think they'll do that because they've just spent £65 million on a player and I don't think they're ready to give up on him adjusting to that position just yet. But from my point of view, if you want to win the league, that would be a very good place to start when it comes to improving the starting eleven. I still feel like if they are going to sign a striker, that uh, it would it feels like the summer is probably more of a realistic time for that. You know, obviously there's lots of Tony talk. Um I don't know if that would happen in January. You know, there's going to be lots of interest in Ivan Tony, not just from Arsenal, from other clubs as well, especially, I imagine, Chelsea, even potentially Tottenham. You know, would Arsenal want to get involved in a bidding war in January for Ivan Tony? I just don't know at this stage. Um, it just feels to me, if you're going to sign a striker, and I know that Arsenal, I'm pretty sure they will sign a striker at some point in the next couple of windows, the summer just feels more, the more likely option where they can really sort of look at the market, look at who out, look at who's out there and make a proper you know, big decision on potentially a player who could lead the line for the next four or five years. So I just, I, I'm a bit suspect about whether that will happen in January, but we'll have to wait and see. But yeah, personally for me, if I wanted to, if Arsenal are going to go into the January window, I think it'd be good to improve your squad. Certainly a potential right winger, I think it'd be a really good option. Another uh, sort of cover as we've always talked about for Bukayo Saka is difficult as I know that is to sign. Uh, someone like Pedro Neto, you know, if that was possible, I think it would be absolutely brilliant signing in January. It would really, really would. Um, and, you know, a left eight midfielder to improve that position and get someone in who's at the moment going to offer more than Kai is doing. But we shall wait and see. Thank you very much for your comment, Wallace. Uh, here's one from Lemonski. He says, I would risk it and finish the season with Jesus and Nketiah. Then in the summer, I'm going all out for Osterman or Ferguson. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, this is kind of what I'm, I'm almost saying in that last response is I think in the summer you have more of an option to really sign a player that you really really want January is really difficult say if they want Osterman and not, I'm not saying they do but say they really want Osterman you've got a hell of a lot more chance of doing that in the summer than you have in January because it's just very doubtful that Napoli will let would let him go in or in a similar position with another club it's difficult to get a top top striker out of a club in January just because you're halfway through that season and that club won't really want to do business contractual things might make it a little bit easier and that's why you sort of look at Tony his contract running down maybe that would convince convince Brentford to do it in January but I don't know I still feel like the summer is and when you say risk it go season of Jesus and Ketia and I know and I've seen lots of you comment in about Eddie since yesterday's video but I still feel like Arsenal are going to score plenty of goals this season they scored more than they've ever scored last season in a Premier League season and they did that with Jesus and Eddie as their strikers you know they share the goals around it is just what this Arsenal team do so I don't think they're necessarily going to be totally short of goals. I don't see going with Eddie and Jesus as your main strikers, probably with Havertz, another option until the end of the season, means that you definitely won't win the title. I just don't think it, because I still think Arsenal are going to score plenty of goals this season. Here's one from, uh, is that L1? Or sort of kind of London Dean or something like that. It says, hi, Charles. First of all, I'd like to offer you my congratulations on the success of your book, which I thoroughly enjoyed reading. Thank you very much. 
Uh, I agree that Arsenal need to consider adding a striker to provide a more clinical edge to the strike force, but I'm not completely convinced that Ivan Tony is the best option. I'd rather see Arsenal go for Ollie Watkins, although I suspect Villa would be looking for a lot of money for him. And that there is also next to no chance that he'd be available in January. Yeah, I can't. He's just signed a new contract about a week ago. You know, it would take huge money to get Ollie Watkins. And yeah, I just don't think that's going to happen. And look, quite a few of you actually have mentioned Ollie Watkins in the last 24 hours, which are why I put this message up there but he's just signed a new contract at Villa. Villa are a very ambitious club at the moment uh, I just don't see that I just don't see that happening. Well. Big Arsenal fans Ollie, Ollie Watkins, I'm sure he'd, I'm sure it'd be a very appealing move to him but um, uh, no, I don't see that happening and also I, I think if Arsenal are going to spend big, big money on a striker, I'm not sure Ollie Watkins is the striker to do that on. Um, I think they need. there's probably stronger options out there but although I'm not too sure who they are at the moment uh, here's one from Irish Bro 1725 says, Hi, Charles. Great to see you with Mikel. Could you tell us what he's like one on one? Is his personality as infectious and magnetic as the likes of Martin and Granite has said before? Yes, it is. Yeah, he's great. Actually, there was really interesting that, that, that my interview of him um, on Wednesday was my first sit down one on one interview I've had with him. Obviously, I've had loads of interactions with Mikel at press conferences, spoken to him loads of times before, asked him questions loads of times before, but it's very rare you get a proper one-on-one interview with um, with a manager, with a player these days. And so this was the first time I've ever actually done that and just sat on my own in a room with him. And it was a really great interview. It was a weird one because it was part of this commercial partnership about a computer game that he's endorsing. And so we weren't actually allowed to talk about Arsenal. It was just off the table. It had to be about, it was about management management and leadership and, and, and things like that to tie in with this endorsement for the computer game. So it's kind of hard in that respect that we couldn't, I couldn't sit there and just talk about the current Arsenal team and stuff like that. You had to think it was a harder interview to put together difficult questions. It was all about leadership and management, but you know, his, his questions, his answers were great. And, you know, when you're in that situation, sometimes Mikel in a press conference, he can just be in a really terrible mood. I'm sure you've all seen it and he can't be bothered. He doesn't want to answer the questions and he's some, and he comes across really, really cold at times in those press conferences, which isn't a surprise because there must be a real hassle to do week after week. But when you're in that sort of environment one-on-one and you're sitting there, it's completely different. He's far more open. He really seems to enjoy it or he seemed to enjoy that interview on Wednesday and some of the questions and some of the answers he was talking about, talking about his family and stuff like that. It was a really engaging interview that I really, really enjoyed. So, uh, yeah, that will be coming out over the next week or so. So keep your eyes peeled for that. And uh, finally, continuing the theme of this international break of ending with a question about a non-football or Arsenal-related question. Here's one from KC Lundy 7 from South Africa. Thanks for the question, Casey. So thanks for the great Arsenal content. You're my go-to channel for all things Arsenal. Thank you very much. Uh, considering your interest in other sports, do you watch rugby? If so, what do you make of the semis? Um, and then the final. Also struggle to understand how England always seem to pitch up for the World Cup. They've been rubbish all year. Yes, they have been rubbish all year. I'm not the biggest rugby fan, I have to admit. I do kind of get on the gravy train for the World Cups um, tournament because I just love big sporting events and the intensity of it all. And um, looking at the semi-final, you know, I, I think England will get past Fiji in the quarters to get the semi-final. I think that'll be the end of them, though, although they've had a decent run in this World Cup and surprised a few of us, um, considering the form they had going into it. I think the semi-finals is as good as they're going to get. Um, I think it, they get set. I can't remember what if I did actually bring, the, bring this up um, uh, to talk about, and I've managed to shut the page down, but um, I did. Um, yeah, I think Wales get through and they get to the semi-final, and I think Wales would play Ireland because I think Ireland are going to beat New Zealand in the quarters. I think it'll be Wales Ireland semi-final. Ireland are going to get through that and get to the final. I think England will just get past Fiji, even though Fiji beat them in the warm-ups, obviously, for the World Cup. I think they'll probably just have enough to get past Fiji, but then they're not going to beat either or France or South Africa in the semi-finals. I think France might, sorry to say, Casey, I think France might beat South Africa. I think home advantage, France is so good at the moment, at home especially. I think they might just have enough with that to get past South Africa. The South Africa Island game was absolutely exceptional. It was a brutal game to watch. I really, really enjoyed that. Um, but South Africa, without a real out and out kicker, that really let them down in that game. And I wonder if it will let them down when the margins are going to be so fine in the game against France. I just feel like France will have enough um, in that game. And I think we'll be looking at a France versus Ireland final. And I think Ireland will just get the job done in that. So that's my rugby roundup. 
<laughs> for today. Thank you very much for your question, Casey. And uh, yeah, cheers for watching from South Africa. All right, everyone, that's it from me. Thank you very much for watching or listening to this wherever you're around the world. I hope you have a very good end to your week on the Friday. And then you have a very good weekend as well. Speak to you soon, everyone. Have a great, great day. Thank you.